everyone. Welcome to the Blue Sky Studios podcast. I'm here with Matthew Garber. Matthew, thank you so much for making time for today. Sure thing, man. Matthew, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself personally and what you do. Kind of like a big old catch up. It's like, what, what am I doing? So Casey knows me most as a mastering engineer. My name is Matthew Garber. Um, I also, I kind of do the serial entrepreneur thing, but I would say uh, I am a husband first. I'm a dad. Um, I own two businesses. I run a podcast and yeah, it's all pretty, it's all pretty fun. Let's see. You want to, you want to hear like how it got started? You want it like all the way back or, or what would you like? Okay. We'll get there. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. That's, that's great, Matthew. That's perfect. Uh, and you like me, uh, you get up pretty early in the morning and that's when you master a lot of the records that we send to you. Is that right? Yeah. So I have, I have two sessions that I allocate for mastering. And so one of them is generally from 6 a.m. until right around 8.30 or 9.00. Normally, like the last thirty minutes are kind of like okay, let's hop in and let's see what we've what we've done. Let's do a let's do a QC lesson, and then that'll be my first thing I do in the afternoon. Sometimes it's five thirty if it's a really busy week. I'll be in here, but then normally it's six, and uh, so six to nine, and I call it the I call it the five to nine before the nine to five, and then I have let's see about four thirty. I start wrapping up my other day. And around 4.45, 5 o'clock, the second mastering session will begin until about 6.15, 6.30. And so it's a full day. I mean, every day is every day is around like 13 hours and then go home and be a dad and husband. And But it's all good. And then sleep. You'll sleep like down the road when you're 50 or 60 years old, exactly. huh? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so something about like this, this coffee, yeah. That's right, that's right. The IV drip of caffeine. Uh, Matthew, we are so grateful to have you on today. We've had uh, your counterpart on the podcast, Sam Moses, before to talk about mastery. Oh, cool. Before we dive into some of the specifics of what you do and what, your, what the role of a, uh, a mastering engineer plays in a record, I'd love to hear a little bit more about your story. Uh, so tell our listeners, how did you get started in mastering and what led you up to where you are today? Hmm. So when I graduated college, it was kind of the middle of the, kind of the middle of like the recession that began in 08. And I moved to a town called Hilton Head, and I was running sound for a bunch of churches at the time. And uh, one of my friends, Kevin Brusher, he's still a really good friend. He's since moved down to Florida. He had old Viking studios in, in Nashville, since moved to Hilton Head, and then now running some studios in Florida as well. He told me, you know, you might like, you really like getting into all of the minutia and finessing things. And he kind of watch how I would do stuff on on boards during live sessions and whatnot. I really wouldn't move around a lot. I like the original source. I don't like like heavily pushing and shoving things through. I like my, you know, just I have my little cuts and I have like, okay, yeah, this only needs this amount of compression. I don't really want to slam anything. He's like, these are kind of like mastery moves and can you like all of this? You might be interested in the dark art. And so I have since graduated to, I should pull out a red lightsaber right now. That would be great. <laughs> I should have come on here with a Darth Vader helmet. But yeah, so I started this business. It was originally called B-Side Mastering. I started that in 2014. And I can't remember when the name changed to For the Record Mastering. There was another place in town that was called like B-Side Studios or something. But it was a video production. And I was like, yeah, I don't really feel like doing that. So I was like, you were here first. It's all changed. And so, yeah, I came up with For the Record Mastering. And I've just really just been growing small in Charleston and then really just word of mouth. And I met up with my podcast counterpart, Sam. I asked him, he, he was offering mentorships at the time. And I said, I don't really want any mentorship necessarily on gear or signal chains or whatnot. But, you know, if I could have like some time, we can talk about, hey, what's the best way to like, more like I really enjoy how you manage and handle your clientele and having seen a lot of my friends go through him and whatnot. It's like, I'd like to know the best way to cater to this type of clientele. And so uh, we did that for about six. And this is sort of a few years, years in the business. You've been gaining some traction. That yeah, sort I'd of like thing. to say maybe four or so years. And I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And uh, we're kind of coming to like the end of the six months that we had initially planned. And 
uh, we're having these really good conversations, just like really fun, organic things. And I had told him that when I used to have, when I was in Hilton, I also had a cigar shop. And so in the cigar shop, we would, we would do a podcast out of there. It was called Blowing Smoke. Please do not look it up. There's like three episodes. They're lewd and not appropriate. And we had no idea how to do a professional thing. But anyway, I was telling him, man, I really miss this. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed this. And, I was like, it'd be fun to kind of get back into that. And it's like podcasts were not a thing at all. And so I asked him, he's like, hey, would you mind? Would you mind or would you like to just take these calls we have and kind of make them every Wednesday and we post every other week makes it super sustainable for both of us. And so him and I just doing that for, I think we're about to wrap up year five going into year six. And he's been a great person just to learn and grow with. And I mean, now we're, I would reckon to say probably best of friends. So, and then my business has just grown and grown. Um, this is, I think studio three and I don't, I don't, I've never really counted how many clients I have. I can tell you. So we're recording this in December and I normally have very slow Decembers. This December is not slow. <laughs> I have, uh, <laughs> I have quite a bit of work. It's just, it, it, it's just nonstop. And so I'm, like super humbled by everyone that they're just interested and that they like what's going on here. And I'd like to figure other ways to grow it. And I have ideas and there's nothing that's necessarily going to be slowing down. So, so yeah, I do. I, yeah. I, I run, well, I run great, two Matthew, sessions. And you do a wonderful job. Man. I appreciate it. So yeah, run two session, sessions a day out of here and it's, it's been pretty darn fun. So I don't mind the early mornings. Yeah. Now you had an interesting, and, I, and I'm going to pull this in a little later of, for our listeners of why I want to ask this question, but you sort of had an interesting pivot you had to make a few years ago because another venture of yours really took off. Tell us about that crossroads and what were the decisions you had to work through on what role the mastering studio played in your life? Mm. Elaborate a little more on ventures. Sure. And I'm not talking about your exotic dancing career. I'm more talking about your company, oh, your lighting sure. company that has taken off and really sure. done really well. Yeah, my, my exotic dancing days are behind me. It's uh yeah, when you get when you get a father figure, the, the with, belly with dancing the up money and smoke doesn't really, podcast. The belly dancing money doesn't really come in as well as it used to. That's why uh they it's either called a dad bot, I call it a father figure. So nice. I like that. Uh, and yeah, so about Eight years ago, yeah, the master business has been around nine years. Emory Allen has been around eight years. I think we're about to start year eight or we're just wrapping it up. But anyway, um, about eight years ago, I was getting out of the cigar business. I was also kind of fixing boats on the side. This is all down in Hilton Head. And I was talking to my dad, who has a bunch of international manufacturing, international business experience. And I said, you know, it'd be a shame if all this information and like wealth of knowledge that you have just kind of goes to naught. And it's like, I'd love to learn how to manufacture stuff and do kind of manage all of this like type of industry. And so the initial thought was to create a product design firm. There was this old, there was this company, I think they're still around. They're out of Palo Alto called IDEO. And uh, it was run by a guy who was like one of Steve Jobs' best friends. And this is like, this company would like, innovate like crazy so like and just like silly things that we use so like the electric toothbrush like they made they would like the, the first computer mouse they made just like little things that like like and one of the notable things whenever you're watching these interviews is they would say like we want to see the point where like people grimace and so like 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 during their day like ah this is this stinks and that would be a key for them for innovation and so it's like i wanted to do a guy wanted to do a company like that. And so we, we kind of have that, but it kind of stopped at the lighting part of it. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe that'll pick up anyway. So we came up with a company. Um, my middle name is Emery. My son's name is Emery. My grandfather's name is Emery. My dad's middle name is Alan. And so we started a company called Emery Allen. That's that business. And so I'm in the front conference room. I watched your video before, and this has the best light and the best everything. So no, no fun studio stuff in the background. And yeah, we, we all, uh, my parents are down in Tampa at the time. They moved down there for about three years and they were helping a church get started. And, uh, my dad was kind of interested about getting out of the role that he was in. And I was interested about getting out of the role that I was in and really just kind of starting another venture. And so we found a manufacturer who had a pretty good product 
And we took her product and really optimized it for the North American market. And uh, yeah, launched right about eight years ago. And so I think June is when we say June 15th. And so it's been a wild ride. So back to your question about how does that integrate with some decisions that I had to make and whatnot. And I mean, these are conversations that my wife and I have had. So it's like, oh, it's like, are you ever going to do like the mastering business full time? Probably. It's it's not it's not even on the horizon. But I don't really think that anything is necessarily suffering because I'm not doing something full time. It's still getting I'm still responding to every email I can as fast as I can and still dedicating as much of myself to projects as I can. And in all honesty, kind of having a bit of a break during the day allows me to, you know, kind of get like a little bit of fresh ears. You kind of get your brain working elsewhere. You're not just kind of fatiguing yourself in front of speakers. Uh, I'm not able to do the 15 song record in a day that some mastering engineers are able to do. It's like, it might take me two or two and a half days, but it's like, you know what? I don't mind having the little bit of break and I don't mind taking a little bit of time. And I don't mind also explaining to clients just, Hey, this is kind of, this is the situation. I normally don't have to, but, and normally mastering houses are so booked out that having like a two day turnaround, two and a half, three day, it's normally I say for like a f- 10 songs, I say, give me 72 hours. Normally that's pretty darn quick because you have places like Sterling and whatnot, and they're booked out however many months at a time. And so normally to have somebody have a turnaround within the same week is pretty unheard of. And so that's kind of a nice thing about having a freelance independent mastering studio is that you can do that turnaround. You can do it like super high quality and I mean, you can like bring tears to people's eyes. I have like a handful of emails of people just being like, man, the client was like borderline crying. He loved it so much. It was like, that's like absolutely humbling. So, so I don't, I don't really think that anything has suffered be- uh, because of that at all. So Matthew, a lot of the people, and, and the reason I want to ask so many of the artists we work with in the bands, they, uh, they have day jobs and they're really on the, always on that the cusp of that question of like, hey, should I do this full time or hey, should I keep my day job and just keep music something that I really enjoy that doesn't pay the bills necessarily. Uh, Any advice for someone listening right now who's in that spot where they're like, man, I'm really struggling to decide if I need to make that jump and go full time with my music or stay where I am? I think it ultimately comes down to your bottom line. And so it's like, if like one, I, I, I've, told, I've only told my wife this. There is a book that I want to write, and it essentially would be a workbook because people don't treat bands and or just singer-songwriter things, acts like a business, and they are. And so I feel like if you were to look at it through the lens of a business, you could make a lot better decisions about your capability and your ability. And you are able to remove the personal aspect of it, and you're able to decide yeah, this is like from a business standpoint, it makes sense to let's go ahead and make this move. And this is what, this is what the numbers say that we're going to be able to do this, 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 and this give, and you you essentially just reverse engineer your situation. I think a lot can be figured out with just like a basic plan and a plan for growth and a like, you know, just some financials in front of you. Like, so do you go on your own? I think it's incredibly unique for every single situation if, I mean, typically it'll be all like, if, if, if the numbers are showing it, then yeah, sure. If you're in your twenties and like early twenties, you are able to screw up in life so much that you can completely mess up any venture you want. And you still have a whole nother life ahead of you to do whatever you want. So like your twenties are whole are a sure. Why not in your thirties? You're, you're a pretty darn young person. It's like, if you have a family and if you have mouths to feed and whatnot, it might not be bad to, you know, keep a job or whatnot. If you're working for a church and stuff like that, you know, it's like, you know what? It's a steady income. You can count on that. I know, let's say like a guy speaking to a guy, I know that females like to have security and not necessarily like protection, sure but like financial. And so it's like, if you can kind of hit those miles, mile markers, because like if I went and without consulting my wife or whatnot and went just full-time mastering, it'd be like, okay, 
we need to we need to talk about the money part of this because you have me who doesn't work. We have two kids we're providing for. You have your mortgage and all that other stuff. And so um, I think a lot of it just comes down to money and just like make an Excel sheet and just look up, hey, what's a basic budget? What's a basic for a business, a profit and loss and a balance sheet? And it's like, where is this money going to come from? Are we able to make this amount? And so what are we able to put into savings? And like, as far as like, like what are we able to put away? Like, is there enough to actually kind of essentially, if something were to happen, like what is like, ins- like to you, the provider, like what does that kind of look like? And so um, I think it's a multifaceted question. It comes down to economics for the most part. And I think, yeah, I think one of the f- things I had this conversation recently with an artist and I, I told him a, the very similar answer. And one of the things that that does too, when you start looking at the numbers, it sort of takes the emotion out of it, whether you're fearful about going full time or you're excited. Uh, sometimes we can be overly one or the other, but if you look at those numbers, they're going to tell the truth all the time. For someone else, uh, another situation here, an artist is a little older. They have a family, maybe just from your perspective, how do they appreciate the fact? So a a little more fill that out. They have a full-time job, a great job, but they feel this tension of wanting to make more art, but they know the right call right now is to keep this something on the side that's just fun. Give them some advice. Like how do you enjoy doing uh, your craft on the side and still really enjoying it? Because I think a lot of the folks feel that tension of like, man, this is where I want to be, but fill in the blank is holding me back. And I've found for myself, there's a lot of joy and contentment when you just say, hey, I'm, I'm glad I get to do it today or this smaller portion. Uh, maybe you could speak to that. That was a very complicated and terrible question. I'm so sorry. No, I just don't think that this is going to be a really nice answer. So my response to that is when I lost my second studio because my business was moving and I pretty much always keep my studio where my business is. And it's just generally my office, the room that would have made most sense for where my studio would be and where my office would be. Didn't mathematically make sense as far as acoustics were concerned. There's a lot of math when it does come to acoustics. If you want to do it properly, I won't say that mine is proper, but I will say it translates incredibly well, which is arguably the most important part of uh, mastering somebody's work is that you want what you're hearing in your studio to translate. So you're not having to run, put on headphones, AirPods, go to your car. You don't want any of that to be your situation. Anyway, the math didn't check out. And I was kind of like, you get in like your whole head. You're just complaining. Like I was doing that. I was like, not not happy and i just have this voice in my head from one of my friends tom limbecker a very very german friend and very like efficiency focused and very like linear thinking as far as that and um part of my french i remember he would just say he's like well do you want to do it like when we were kids he's like well if you want to do it just do it. Quit your bitching. And that was just like in my head from when we were in high school together. And he would just be that straightforward and that linear thought of like, I don't see what the problem is. Just, just do it. If you want to do it, then just do it. Quit complaining about it. And so uh, I was like, okay, I'll set up my room, I guess. And I guess it'll be okay. And so I set up speakers in there and I did something that I call on our podcast, I call it the naked listen to where like you set up your whole system, but you don't, um, you don't put any treatment up and you just listen to the room, just bare. you, this is up to you. You can have clothes on. I generally do, but you just kind of listen to what the room's telling you. And then you're like, okay, here's a reflection. Here's a reflection. It's like, you kind of know, it's like your corners are going to have like, like, I guess the screen's a little tight corners. You're going to have, I could point to like the screen right here, corners of the screen. You're going to have some low end buildup. You know that there's going to be an axis off the side of the speaker. That's going to have like an angular reflection from that's going to be like the first reflection that the speaker hits the wall, comes back to you. You know that there's like a triangle that like is the perfect triangle for the sweet spot of most speakers. And so it's like, okay, what are my knowns? It's like a, it's a physics problem. And then how do we kind of work ourselves 
backwards from the physics problem of, okay, let's treat for this. And so I honestly, it was like the first room I've ever done like that. And I treated it all by ear and I love how it sounds. And it all came from just being like, just, just quit complaining and just hop into it. So back to your question, I would say, how do I have time to do what I do? You take an inventory of your day. Everything you do, write it down. And what time you wake up, to what time you eat breakfast, if you eat breakfast, to what time you go to work, what you do at work. Like like every hour, log what you're doing. Even if you're just like at home, fudding your dud on your phone, just like scrolling, like the infinite scroll. It's like, I don't know why I can't go to sleep. I'm holding this phone that's a blazing white light 15 inches from my face. I don't know why it's not working. Why, why am I not drifting into a peaceful slumber? Log that time. Log what time you go to bed. Log what you do before you go to bed. And what are you left with? You're left with the other time. You, you, you essentially have, a, you, you're able to see the things that you are doing that are, are productive in that day. And you're able to see the things that are not productive. You can make little pieces, you can rearrange them. But all, and it's like, don't get me wrong. It's like, you know, I have like, two kids it's like i'm gonna want some like time to myself to not be like watching kid shows or like listening to kid like things or and so it's like yeah you do need that time i'm an introvert i need time to like reset i'm not like sam who this man thrives off other people's energy that is not me i thrive off of like my batteries being my batteries charged when i'm by myself i don't do it in a rude way (laughs) but anyway you find what time you have available and you just say, you know what, if I go to bed by 10 or 10.30, I know I like going to bed at 11.30, 12 o'clock, but if I go to bed at 10 or 10.30, I can probably make this 5 a.m. thing work. Don't get me wrong. I am really bad. I Like last night, I got on this show. There was this guy on the Joe Rogan podcast talking about this like ancient apocalypse. He's got a show on Netflix now. I was up till one. Don't take my advice at all. But just kind of know that you do have to come in and you do have to be productive after you do that stuff. No one's perfect. Everyone gets it wrong. My kids get sick. They, you, they literally are sitting on your lap and you feel bad for them. They're all hot and snotty. And then they turn around, they look at you, they say, Daddy, I love you. Then they sneeze in your mouth. And now guess what? Two days later, you're sick. Your whole weekend's gone. Everything you've worked for in your schedule. But it's like, you know what? That's just life. But figure out the time that you do have available, whether... I mean, and unfortunately, normally it's pretty darn early in the morning. So I did find out, being several years into this, that I'm better off just starting at 6 a.m. than 5.30 because I used to do 5.30. And I actually am no more efficient than if I start at 6. I actually burn that extra 30 minutes just taking breaks for my ears and whatnot and just kind of like recentering where I am. And I'm realizing it's like I'm tired I'm up at like 5.30 in the morning. If I just get that extra 30 minutes of sleep and then I come in at 6, I'm way better off and I'm way more efficient and I've had more sleep. So there's a fine tuning that you need to do. Um, but it is... it Yeah, and just looking for those margins in life and, and where these artists that are, are busy uh, can enjoy their craft. Yeah, I mean, no don't get me wrong. If you're playing like a, like a bar or something like that till like 1 or 2 in the morning, your margin is definitely another time during the day. So I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. That was a kind of sloppy answer. You're good, man. You're good. It was a sloppy question, but the answer was great. Well done. So Matthew, as we're kind of landing the plane here, uh, tell our listeners maybe what they should expect from mastering. I think a lot of times someone knows they're working through the mix process. They're working on revisions. They've gone back and forth with their mix engineer. Uh, what, you know, in 30 seconds or a minute, what should they expect from the mastering process? It's impossible to do it that short. You essentially should feel a finality, a completeness, a like, ah, okay, we're done. We can, we can take this to release. This is, this is sounding perfect. Everything is going to master differently, but there should be a, there should be a, essentially when something is done like professionally, it is, like 100% like it is 100% like what it could potentially be. And it's like, if you're, if you're getting it done properly, then 
it's like that person is kind of taking it to the limit of what is possible. Don't get me wrong. There are some things you might need to do, like a mixed revision that I might ask for. But it's like, for the most part, it's like you should have like a cohesiveness. You should have a cohesive song. It should replay back, you know, at a complete, let's talk about loudness at a, at a competitive level. Um, I think loudness is becoming less and less important as we move forward in this musical journey. I think it's, it's not less important for me. It's less important for the artist I'm feeling like. And more times than not, I'll deliver it at a level that I believe it should be delivered at. And I mean, a handful of times I'll have people like, hey, can we dial it back a little bit? It's like, I'd love that. That would be great. We have more dynamics. We, can, we have all this now preserved. That's fine. But if you're given if you're given the mastering engineer references of stuff that's peaking at minus four, it's like, okay, yeah, sure. It's like, we'll see how close we can get it. Um, but what you should have is you should have, let's say it's a song. You should have, you should have a highly intelligible song. It should sound um, professionally polished, like kind of buffed out. I, I, I'd say the difference between mixing and mastering is kind of the difference between like washing and waxing a car. My wife had a great analogy for it. She said the difference between mixing and mastering is, you know, like when, uh, you know, like when Toy Story came out in like 95 on Pixar and you had like the, like the people kind of looked weird and the faces kind of looked weird, but now you see Pixar today and it's like, whoa, this is like, like I could see this guy on the street. It's kind of like the difference between that and not saying anything's wrong because like Pixar in 95 was like mind blowing when you consider like we had Aladdin and Little Mermaid. I think that would be my one minute answer. <laughs> you have to trim it down. But that's good. No, that's, that was good. That, that's that was what good. I think what I would say. If you have a record, though, I would say that you have a complete cohesiveness and that you have a fluidity to the album. And hopefully there was not chaos going into it. But if one song was really loud, one song was really not, if that's intentional, maybe there's like a nice little bridge between that where it's like this gap now makes sense. Or it's like, how do we... And, and a, lot of, a lot of my job is like, how do we tell the story of this record? And so, but I think back to what I said at the beginning, there should be like a sense of, this is what was in my head in the beginning. Now it's out and I can, I can release it. This is, this is perfect. This is finished. We are done here. And you can, you can start on the next record. So that's my hope. That's my (laughs) goal for it all. No, that's good, Matthew. Well, Matthew, where should people uh, find out about your and Sam's podcast and for the record master? Oh, uh, you mean uh, you mean you mean that that right there? Oh, look oh at that. you guys uh, that are just audio listeners, you can't see this beautiful logo they it's have. It's like for the Price is Right. Da, 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 da. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh. So, where can you find us? Was that the question? I was worried about bringing the mug into view. No, you're good. You're good. Yeah. Tell it, tell our listeners uh, where they can find out more about your podcast. And then if they wanted to use you for mastering, uh, how would they? Yeah. Do that? So uh, the podcast can really be found anywhere that podcasts are found. So iTunes, I, I know like Google play and then Stitcher and overcast, like we're, we're, we're all there. I know we're done. I know we're on Spotify. You go to uh, the attack and release show. It was originally brought out for mastering engineers, but now like everybody's like commenting on it. And it's really funny that we really just wanted to have a really small market and it's just kind of blossomed into this really like kind of fun and humbly large thing. And we have no idea like how we should listen to it, but you can find it in any, in any of those platforms. Uh, iTunes is kind of the main one. We're hosted on Fireside. So if you search the Attack and Release Show, it'll take you to fireside.com slash the Attack and Release Show. For those of y'all who don't do any audio engineering, attack and release was based off of the compressor knobs. And I think I was looking at just like like a VLA or what is it? The yeah, the Art Pro VLA. And it has like the attack and release knobs on it. And when I like when I thought of it, I was like, yeah, sure, let's do that. Anywhere that can be found, you can find me um, on Instagram. You can go to my website. It's really just for the recordmastering.com or on Instagram just at for the record mastering. And you see my white logo. Sometimes I'll change it to the black logo. I don't know. So, whatever you're feeling right day, right? Well, Matthew, thank you so much for your time, man. We appreciate you. Sure, man. You need anything else from me? No, that was great. And guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of the Blue Sky Studios podcast. Have a great day, everyone.